Dr. Celia Victor sees hundreds of students from elementary school and high school throughout the year. Some of these students come from single-parent households, students who live with grandparents, aunts, uncles, or cousins. And some of her students are also parents who are trying to learn the basics of raising a child. The parent must have the tools to be parents. And if they don't have all the tools, they need to reach out for help from those in the community that can help them. Because, help, because this day and time, children are technology savvy. They communicate different from how we communicate. So one of the things that I think is a disconnect with them is they don't know how to feel and interact with others through social interactions because their social interaction is through a text, through a, sending a text message. Forget about calling, sending a text. And so that social interaction, let's bond, what's that to them? So that's something that their parents must teach them. Their teachers must teach them the benefit of doing that besides texting. Texting is great, but why is it important to interact with another person and watch them face to face and shake their hand and have camaraderie? That's something we must teach them. I currently work here at the Family Youth Intervention Program under Family Resource Center. I've been here for roughly four to five years. Um, and the program is divided in two portions. One portion is the Anger Management Prevention Program for adolescents. The second portion is the rites of passage for young middle school boys. And both are wonderful in the sense they allow us to empower young people to learn themselves, learn their culture, and understand the impact of, the impact of consequences. Um, and so in doing this program for several years, I've seen young men who came through this program who maybe were labeled ADHD or oppositional and about to graduate from high school. Um, and that's exciting because it means that while they were here, they learned something along the way. That's not to say they didn't, they didn't have issues and they still don't have issues, but they see that there's, there's hope. And there is hope, you know, but I think prevention is key. And back to your question initially, is intervention better than prevention? It isn't. It's better to, do, to be preventative and prevent the issue from ever occurring than having to really step back in and then we can do corrective measures to address the issue, which may or may not work. For anyone to suggest that a gang problem doesn't exist throughout the territory need only refer to the homicide rate in 2009. Out of the 56 homicides that occurred last year, more than half can be linked to acts of reprisal. And as we approach the first six months in 2010, we could very well be on our way to surpassing the previous number of 56. In the early 1970s, the first loose alliance of a gang in the U.S. Virgin Islands originated in St. Croix. To some, they were known as the Post Office Gang. To others, they were called the Hoodlum Gang. Most of the members were veterans from the Vietnam War who were jaded by discrimination within the ranks of the military. Returning to the islands with little hope of a future, five key members conspired to rob as many tourists as possible at a location where they would most likely be relaxing and enjoying themselves. A golf course named Fountain Valley would forever be known as the Fountain Valley Massacre. My name is Bowman Jerome I was born in August of 1950. Uh, I'm presently serving eight consecutive life sentences plus 15 years for my conviction in the uh, 1972 Founder Valley case. Uh, I've been incarcerated now for a period of uh, 37 years. And the father of three children. The one thing that's similar then to what it is now was fear. The motivating factor with myself and my peers on the street, we were scared, we were fear, we were filled with fear. And that's the same thing with the youth that I see today. It all goes back to, uh, I guess you may say race. Race played a part, because that's what we use, we focus our negative energy on the so-called white people at the time. You know? We saw them as the ones edging out our future. You know, like if, if, if 
we, if we, if we looked at, at the head we see the way things were growing economically, businesses and whatnot. We look at the government and we, if we didn't see ourselves in the future, then we blame the European. You know, we say, well, they, they didn't want to change the angle, so that's where our honest animosity was directed to the European. You know? And um, to expropriate from them in any way, funds, you know, we saw that as a, like a liberation. We felt like, well, you know, they stole from us. They stole from us from, from all the way back to Africa, you know. So what we're taking from them is just our oh, that was the mindset mm -hmm. of our generation then. You know? But it was it didn't extend to each other uh, based on color. You know? okay. uh, we it was no robbing, you know, one one another the, the, the type of jealousy you hear about now, you know, this one regards how we get his money, his proceeds, if he has a gold chain and we want that now it's not safe. Right. And it's cash for gold and, and everything. And it's black on black. Right, and, 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 and when we coming up, that was unheard of. And I'm not sure one of the greatest things that I've learned now is to not see the world in colors. You know? Black and white, red and blue. That's the pitfall right there. If you can get over that, they see, like the, 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 the song in Vogue say, be color uh, blind, don't be so shallow. Free your mind and the rest will follow. Be colorblind, don't be so shallow. You know? That's one of the main things to be. You know? Seeing the world in colors is, is, is a terrible pitfall. If you see the world black and white, it don't, it don't, it don't, it don't work like that. It's not black and white, you know? From the early 90s until his capture and conviction in 1996, Roberto Smalls was considered by law enforcement to be at the center of a drug smuggling operation that imported cocaine into the United States from the Virgin Islands. Back then, there were no Bloods, Crips, or Latin Kings in the Virgin Islands. Gangs were referred to as posses, small organized groups of individuals intent on making money from drugs. Drafted in the third round by the Chicago Cubs in 1988 as a pitcher, Roberto Smalls had the talent and physical ability to enjoy a bright future in Major League Baseball, but not the desire. Even the allure of his contract reported to exceed a million dollars could not dissuade him from the money that could be made on the streets. Now serving a life sentence at the Golden Grove Correctional Facility on St. Croix, Roberto talks candidly to the camera for the first time. Nobody expected me to end up in, like I say, in prison. They saw me maybe future half of fame uh, and whatever else have you, right? And and I feel I've let down a lot of people, right? But that's where I come into play right now, whereas I excel to a lot, to a, you know, up there where a lot of people, you know, never made it, you know, to a certain level, could have, go, could have went farther, but don't, as a parent, as a coach, as a senator, as a judge, don't map a child's future out for him and don't be there to make sure that he makes it. Correct. It's easier to be drawn to the negative than the positive because in being drawn to the positive, it's a, it's a challenge. Correct. You know, it takes nothing to pick up a gun and a knife and stab and shoot somebody. It takes no brain muscle. You know, you, you, you know, like in, in other instances, whereas you know, look, looking at me right now with my situation that I wrapped up in, if I could go back in so time, yes. I would. I wouldn't even be on Mandela Circle at three, four o'clock in the morning at all. Correct. You know, but hindsight is twenty twenty. So that's why you know I feel it's imperative of me, right, to dedicate the rest of my life and things like that to make sure 